The discovery of odd things has always been a part of life in the Pacific Northwest. Northwest natives have many stories about the first people. Native American folk tales list the great accomplishments of a group of powerful and wise ancestors and animals who took part in the creation of the world. These narratives remain in the contemporary Native American belief system even today. When explorers from Europe first laid eyes on Puget Sound 500 years ago, everything must have seemed amazing. Huge, ancient trees must have suggested to the visitors a place of legend, a land of giants, a place of the past. As pioneers flooded into these mythical Native American lands from all over the United States, they discovered many artifacts which suggest a very ancient history. This is an early Stanwood area threshing crew. Uh, this is an old sepia photo that uh, we think is about 1880 or 1885. This obviously was pulled by horses. And you can see these guys are pretty proud. They must have dug these up in the fields as they were digging down into the soil. But life was usually too precarious in the early settlers' world to worry about ancient artifacts and their meaning. Artifacts? suggesting sea forms and black ravens are found at just about any excavation site in the Pacific Northwest. Hell, you couldn't dig an outhouse pit without turning up some pieces of old pottery. Most pieces were fashioned from soft clay found in the Northwest and baked in wood-fired pits. Some, like this nest of sea forms, must have been very popular we find them everywhere we dig, even today. I think that this kind of thing really helped to make uh, the acceptance of art popular back then because uh, every family really had them. These are commonplace. Uh, they're common, but they're very, very beautifully done. Yeah. You know, we think they were done by a team, by a team of people, not just by one man. Many pioneer homes had a collection of these ceramics. They were assumed to be Native American. Local tribes would refer to them as the Ancient Ones. They ended up on pioneer shelves with more recent artifacts, more clearly linked to the local people. The first change in understanding came when a local artist antique collector began assembling a collection of the pottery found on or near Kameno Island where he lived. He called them his Kameno Folk Art Study Project and kept an eye out for local examples. This has taken me years to find these. I found this in Snohomish, of course, looking through the antique stores. It appears that two of my pots ended up in a brothel in, in San Francisco. A breakthrough came in 1995 when a local landscape designer and art dealer found a huge cache of shards and evidence of an early settlement while rearranging a new crop of trees from the Kubota Garden Collection. For Jack Gunter, it was a discovery that would change his life. Within weeks, Gunter had found evidence of a compound. Four building foundations and a temple-like structure leading to a door, seven feet under the soil of Kameno Fearing the destruction of the site that crowds of curious onlookers would wreak and lacking the necessary permits, Gunter worked at night for three cold, wet Pacific Northwest seasons. Uh, 
to this is the storyboard for the for the film, which is a recreation, your recreation of, uh, uh, of uh, your, from your best study of uh, how the culture that you have uh, exhumed and examined and analyzed. Actually, uh, yes, we've discovered the evidence of an ancient civilization that appeared to be based near present-day Mount Vernon. I've been putting together artifacts and gluing pieces together from small shards and trying to figure out what the hell we've got here. A lot was learned about this culture when these two urns were assembled and examined. Now this urn has indications that any Northwest navigator would recognize. It's a map. It's a crude but remarkably accurate map of the Strait of Juan de Fuca and the islands of Puget Sound. The known world was smaller then. It stretched from Camano Island to present-day Friday Harbor. The end of the known world began near Port Angeles, Washington, an opinion still widely held there today. And this is also a map. It tells us about a natural disaster, an event which spelled the doom of a civilization, an event which caused these stories to be told and then found 20,000 years later in our time. This right here is Whidbey Island, and Whidbey Island, if you know our, the geology theories, was sort of left as a lateral moraine as this glacier moved south, and then when it melted back, this is basically what was left in a sort of a snowplow fashion of a lot of pieces. Kamano Island was probably the next one down to be a lateral moraine. But what we envision this culture being is perhaps somewhere in this region here, which of course was obliterated by one mile of ice sort of scraping it clean. So we basically, it was brought down a ways and collected on Camino Island. But it's true that, that we found some evidence from that culture, but most of the stuff we have from Camino we think is sort of a folk tale from people in Camino. Years, hundreds of years later, after this, thousands of years, just talking about the good old days in Mount Vernon before the ice sheet came and scraped it away. So most of what we have here are sort of narrative, told, passed down histories and myths and legends that we've put together. Can I show you some? Yeah. This is sort of the entrance here where we have the only pot that was ever found intact. You can probably see it better from the side. Now this was found under a lintel stone behind the Hagen's department store in um, Stanwood, actually. And most of the things we found are just little artifacts. But this, this was intact? This was completely intact along with a few pieces of furniture. Ah. Remind me a little bit of Howard Carter in the 20s when he looked into the yeah, tomb. It seems like it was uh, the culture here is indicated by the, the, the menagerie here. Is, uh, we basically. Rather, uh, well, my goodness, look at that. That was a, uh, a sort of a premonition of some uh, uh, deco forms there. Uh, well, we figured that this piece here is uh, an ancient ferry terminal. And uh, this is when the water is receded, apparently, after some large flood type event. And uh, this is what probably we could consider as a Noah's Ark type of a, a boat, which had rescued all these animals. And it has a strange echo of the Kalakala, actually. But we sort of think that, that every, every cultural uh, ep epic has a sort of a Kalakala type boat that they uh, that means a lot to them. Yeah, that shows a real sophistication on your part to, to see those archetypes. As we think it was made of copper because of the green patina on it. I think that we have evidence that they discovered copper and had a, a fairly good working knowledge. We also discovered they worshipped the flying pig. There's that pig right there. And there's an earlier looking ferry boat that looks quite Egyptian, but we'll have more to talk about that later. Skill. Yeah, I'm a painter. I, I basically just wanted to do some paintings in this show that would represent my viewpoint for each of these rooms. And having found these artifacts, I still wanted to put some of my own art into this into this exhibit.
Are these actual documents of your discovery? Uh, no, this is this is a completely staged place that I put together because I wanted to make a very simple concept. And of course, these aren't real. These aren't legitimate. This woman is not an archaeologist. So I created this site with a backhoe. With a backhoe. Yeah. I got to use a backhoe. That was one of the most interesting parts of my discovery was driving that machine around for a couple of days. You can see the actual scrapes from the backhoe on the wall. That, those aren't ancient uh, hieroglyphs. Those are just uh, tooth scrapes. Now the objects are legitimate in here. These are the these are the actual original objects. These things, of course, were found in broken pieces and put back together. So I don't mean to imply that. For instance, this Macarena pot really was not found in that state. Although this one here, the one that we saw in the first part of the video, that one definitely, that was the only piece that we did find in one piece, and we did find it in a, a protected area. Now, of course, I should tell you, Paul, honestly, that uh, this is a recreated footage, too, for the film. These are the actual photographs of us finding these things. The soil was much more compact than that. Archaeologists sort of cringe when they see us doing this because uh, these, although we traditionally did things correctly and gridded off the area, we sort of did this to create this environment. So I don't want people to take this seriously except to sort of get the idea that something was discovered here. Well, I think as long as you're candid about that, it's fine. Well, I, I want to be honest here. The story of a catastrophic flood is common to many cultural folk histories. The Camino excavation contains seven such narratives, each one etched and pierced and underglazed onto large ceramic jars that, when intact, obviously served the purpose of recording local tales and histories. Clearly visible on all of these narrative jars is the shape of a large boat. Its significance was not immediately obvious. Fortunately, there are clues on each of these pots that, when taken together, reveal the reason for this obsession with a boat. A boat with ties to the ice. A boat with a connection to something very nasty that happened a long time ago. Something awesome enough to create a legend. This is the Kent Valley, south of Seattle. 12,000 years ago, one-tenth of all the water on the planet sat frozen right over there. And it was melting. 10,000 years ago, the Kent Valley was a river, 15 miles wide and 20 feet deep in the summer, as the ice sheet turned to water miles from the sea. Many huge rivers found their way to the Pacific Ocean in the days of the Great Melt-Off. Big, fat torrents of water were everywhere, headed for the shoreline. Hills like these appeared as little islands in a continually flowing sea. As the great wall of ice that stretched north for 6,000 miles began to melt back, billions of tons of water flowed into the Pacific Ocean. Meltwater easily flowed into the low basins and therefore found the sea, except for one exit, a steep-walled canyon near what is now called Missoula, Montana, somehow remained unaffected by the rapid melting that the climate was causing. A body of water built up as the ice receded behind it. It filled an area now known as Western Montana, 
At one point, this artificial lake was as large as Lake Michigan today. Lake Missoula, as it is now called, got deeper and bigger and was about to meet the sea all at once. Physical landscape features in eastern Washington suggest that 10,560 years ago, the dam gave way. Well, we think that perhaps that Lake Missoula up in Montana that gave way 10 or 15,000 years ago, we think that was a significant event in the consciousness of these people. If you were watching Lake Missoula from some high point and watched a half a mile of water sweep over the eastern Washington Plains, I think you'd be obsessed with the idea that uh, something, some major calamity happened. I mean, I... The Northwest is filled with monuments to a great arc. People still worship in them, just south of the Mount Baker Range. There was a growing body of evidence that suggests the story of Noah and his ark had its roots in the Pacific Northwest. Many attempts to locate the remains of this legendary vessel on the snowy sides of Turkey's Mount Ararat have met with failure. Perhaps they should look instead at Mount Baker. This one here suggests that whatever kind of boat was found seemed to be lost in a sea of icebergs. Apparently the weather was pretty bad during those times because it was, of course, the Ice Age. And this one here is another weather-related boat scene. And Here's that boat, which again has an uncanny relationship to the Calacula. Yeah. Apparently being struck by a lot of lightning. This is a very dark pot and it's a very stirring piece, but uh, I think these, this was a stirring time. This is a very Egyptian looking boat. Apparently there were some characters up here on top and there, and there are a strange bunch of animals, including kangaroos. Of course, we know that there was a land bridge to Australia about 80,000 years ago, predating our land bridge to Siberia by quite a bit. And, and we strangely enough have a beagle here too, which we, a number of dog people were curious about. They didn't think the beagle really had a lineage that went back to this era. Well, that's pretty well true. They're wrong. Well, there's no disputing the evidence, really. Uh, we can't imagine what a boat here 30,000 years ago would be doing in Egyptian times 20,000 years later, but it's now pretty well established that this land bridge was a two-way street, and a lot of people from this area were going into Asia uh, during the Ice Age, and we think the Egyptians stole this idea from us, and we find a lot of evidence later on of other cultural influences from our society. You know, we think the people coming one way with the Clovis points and these little arrowheads were really not very interested to our people who were going to the east with the early edition machines. I think what's important here is that we found this one which suggests an actual eyewitness to the building of this ark. And if I can spin this around, uh, where's our best light here? That's pretty good right here. Okay. Can I, this one spins nicely because it's got an off-center bottom. Now down here, Paul, we have a cutaway view, reminiscent of an earlier show I had, as a matter of fact, at Bumper Shoot. In this cutaway view, there are some people deep underground, apparently mining some kind of ore. Apparently the ore was taken to the top of this mountain and rolled down this hill where, oddly enough, a pig with a cart would take it past here into another place. It does go by two people here arguing about some kind of a measuring system. Reminds me of that Bill Cosby thing where Noah didn't know what a cubit was. Uh, apparently this ore was put into this place here, sort of a hopper by these beautiful women and um, as the ore went down into this reduction furnace it was melted and these people would take it down to here where a large crucible with wheels on it and wheels are common to our culture and they sort of disappeared for the next 20 or 30,000 years until fairly recent times. Based upon the now questionable Clovis culture theory of human migration into the Americas, 
It is not surprising that archaeologists digging artifacts on this side of the world have never found a wheel. Wheels, inclined planes, tapered screws, and other advances in technology are artifacts associated with advanced civilizations like those on the old side of the world. Scattered bands of nomads roaming around North and South America could hardly be expected to be bursting with ideas for inventions. Life was too easy here. The early cultures in Mexico and South America knew all about circles, for instance. They used them in designs and calendars. <laughs> they just never put one under a wagon. The Camino Island excavation unearthed lots of wheels. This was bad news to more conservative archaeologists. Um, so this was taken over here, and I can spin the pot as you... This ore, now melted, was taken over to this other building here, this other wonderful piece of architecture, where these people here are actually seem to be pouring it into some shapes that made molds and that formed big blocks of this material, which we think was copper. I mean, it's pretty obvious that they didn't have too many metals to work with, but copper would have made a lot of sense in the Northwest. And then apparently here we have a team of hammering type men that were hammering this flatter and flatter and flatter and into fairly malleable sheets. And Now this is a strange thing. This looks a lot like an early secretarial tool which is used to create holes in the copper. Well, these things are not very common these days with the age of computers, of course. Apparently uh, there are some people here, I'm going to turn it back for you a little bit. These people are taking these finished sheets up and they are putting them in place in this architectural backbone of this arc and, and they're putting in the window frames here and they're just starting to put in the walls. This is sort of an early version we think of the creation of the arc and how often do you get that, of course. Meanwhile, at the Rocky Point Garden excavation, a new discovery. The partial remains of a chair had been previously found near the surface, but discarded as 20th century junk. It was an artifact from the 1950s, a metal and leather chair, once called the Wassily Chair, by the designer Marcel Breuer, in honor of his pal, the painter Wassily Kandinsky. One of your paintings? Yes, it's a work that I'm rather fond of. A good piece of abstract painting, don't you think? Yeah. It's, uh... Oh. <laughs> it's, uh, it's remarkable. Certainly got a lot of color. No doubt about that. Uh, what does it represent? Represent? Why, it doesn't represent anything. Why should it? It's a picture, an independent entity. There's no reason to imitate something else. No, no, I suppose not. It, it, it's just that I'm sort of used to looking at pictures of people and objects, uh, you know. Why? Uh, why? Well, it's, um, um, uh, uh, why? It was irrelevant to the dig. What was interesting was below. A second chair, much older, was now revealed, deeper in the same excavation. This was also a false alarm. It was fashioned of oak, not a material expected to survive 20,000 years in the damp Camano Island soil. This chair was interesting to a different type of antiquarian. It was a simple armchair, once a rocker, manufactured by the Gustav Stickley Company in 1907. These pieces, in good condition, are very collectible to the owners of thousands of bungalows, made at the turn of the century in the Pacific Northwest. Was this older object found deeper in the excavation 
A sign of further and earlier artifacts yet to be unearthed? This is the first known example of what has been theorized about for years, but never found. A chair shaft. On the third day of digging, they found what they were looking for. Twenty-three feet under the Camano Island surface rested a construction of iron and bronze and mastodon tusks. Covered in rust and scale from its 20,000 year internment under glacial chill. This mastodon chair was the first object that suggested that this was more than a nomadic village discovered here on Camino Island. Metal was used here. Metal that was extracted, concentrated and manipulated and it predated the Bronze Age by at least 5,000 years. Bronze Age tools have been known in Europe as far back as 14,000 BCE but their tools were as primitive as can be. This was much older and more than a primitive implement. Certainly, there was more to the civilization than first met the eye. We think there might have been people from taller, taller cultures that came, and this sort of a, could accommodate. Uh, but this, we don't have any grease left to stick it in. It doesn't work very well, but, you know, it's old. This is for the short people. Has that helped at all? Yeah. Oh, okay, great. Oh, well, that's... Ten objects from the Camano Island site suggest a level of science and mass sophistication unheard of in these ancient times. Of the reconstructed artifacts, one pot stood alone in color, texture, and shape. It was a grooby green colored cylinder decorated with a regular pattern of square holes and raised blocks. Were these features purely decorative or did they imply some kind of language or counting system? Archaeologists have known for some time about a system of communication that the Inca civilization used in the ancient times before the Spanish conquest in the 1600s. It consisted of an ordered sequence of knots tied in a series of parallel strings. These sets of knots were called kipa by the ancient people whose kingdom stretched across the backbone of the rugged Andes Mountains 400 to 800 years ago. Examples are still available from high-level antiquities dealers, but they are rare. By carefully noticing the placement of the knots and their relationship to the knots near them in neighboring strings, a casual reader could, seven centuries ago, understand the weaver's message. Keep a writing utilized mathematics and craft to convey information much like the high-speed computers of today. They were the invoices and the newspapers and the libraries of the Inca society. There was even a special set of knots which were understood only by the privileged few. High priests and politicians of the day could pass coded messages without fear of translation. It was an early form of what we now know as encryption. When the green Kamano pot design was visually unraveled into what archaeologists call a rollout, the design looked very similar to knots in a chain of 15 string. There was clearly information in this decoration, but what did it signify? Within days of the green pot's discovery, a computer software analyst interpreted the series of bumps and holes. The pattern was a binary code, the simplest mathematical counting system in the universe. I suspect that the Inca system was a long evolved offshoot of this very early uh, binary pot where the messages uh, here are running long vertical rows. This strange green vessel had more secrets to reveal. 
The numbers represented by this binary base surface were prime numbers, the most magical numbers in the world. Many of us think that we're looking at a pure and very simple message, too elegant for primitive man. Was this a message from a higher being? Is this evidence of the voice of God? This simple mathematical proposition here is, is interesting because of the universal implications. However, the, the church doesn't, would not, never recognize a thing like this. And if people indeed lived, you know, 20,000 years ago, maybe so. What does it matter? What does it matter? You know, and when you consider these people were 30,000 years old, way before the decimal system, it is the simplest number system. Just a zero and one would have been a wonderful way to start mankind uh, on a counting idea. Is the message on the green pot the voice of God? Did the ancient Inca Empire base its math and language systems on a holy binary code? sent here to Kamano Island thousands of years before? A computer analyst working as a volunteer on the excavation project came up with a possible solution based on early musical devices. He asked this question, if this pot were to spin, what would it sound like? If this vessel was part of a music-making device, like a music box or a player piano, you'd have three sets of five chords that would keep repeating. This is chord five. It only contains high notes. It sounds like... And now I have a recreation of this voice of God, as you would call it, and it plays six different songs. They're similar, but they're not quite the same. And, the, and isn't it ironic that in this world that we live in where there's people killing each other over the fact that one person and one religion thinks that the other religion is not getting it right? Basically, it's the same message, and I think that perhaps the message that fell to Earth had a lot of different interpretations that came from the same data. How many wars, how many crusades have been, and how many people have been slaughtered in little villages because they just were in a disagreement with the way the voice of God sounds, you know. And the message is always the same, but there's just a human twist to it that sort of causes all the conflict. A significant thing we found in this binary code uh, system was this series of glass artifacts. These things are what we believe are hymnals, which use the voice of God in sort of a handheld fashion, so they're more transportable. One of these was done in a blue, and it's uh, basically intact. And this one down here, which has been censored or broken or in some way uh, destroyed, uh, has uh, all red data, which we think probably was a different musical mode, perhaps a Lydian mode versus a, a Mixedillian. And the one that we like, of course, the most is this one with all these colors. We think this is the very first Unitarian. This one is the first pot that we found that showed evidence of conflict. From what we can determine, this is a map of uh, Kamano Island. And right here uh, there's a dock where, of course, now there's a bridge to Stanwood. As you spin this pot around, we see a very large and a very vibrant culture that we see later evidence of this art in uh, the Olmec culture in Mexico. Very similar heads are found uh, in Mexico even now, and they're not quite sure where they're from, but of course now you know they're from probably from Camano. They're wondering if they're African or if there's some European influence on the early Mesoamericans, but we think it was just people from Camano and Mount Vernon that had to move south during the end of the Ice Age. But what's significant here is that this army, Apparently there is a very bellicose people 
and there is armies and armies and soldiers and mounted horsemen and uh, people practicing and they seem to be all headed across Camino Hills all the way down to the south end by the way, you can see the cascades in the background here. It's a very accurate map of Camino. Uh -huh. And it's past the baths here. There was a, a famous set of baths here, which is real similar to where my hot tub right now is uh, located, ironically. Uh -huh. um, and there are stories that still persist for that. Could that be ironic or coincidentally? Uh, could be coincidental, but it is ironic. Uh -huh. You're smarter than me with those words. <laughs> No, apparently down here at the very south end was the center of aesthetic culture. At the uh, south end of Camino. Yeah, and uh, once again we have a similar uh, coincidence on Camino right now where we're down there. We think this pot suggests there was an aesthetic cleansing when the conservatives took power with a great deal of force. and. This is the day when they went down to the south end to kick some art ass. Yeah. And since that, we think that this is sort of maybe the turning point from uh, the renaissance of Camino Island until the sort of the dark days of conservatism that followed afterwards. From what we determined, this pot, which appears to be white letters on a black board, is some kind of a schoolhouse arrangement, maybe something to teach the children. We determined that it's a number system that started with zero and went down to a number that was 15 digits below zero. Instead of double digits when we reach the numbers 10 through 15, the schoolhouse pot suggests single digits until the 16th number. Using this method, we can easily determine the identities of the unknown icons. The number 16 is curiously represented by the familiar number 10. What we have here then is a system of number counting based on the number 16. There's nothing sacred about the decimal system that we use on most of the planet today. The decimal system is an Arabic invention showing up around 7,000 years ago. It's handier than most counting systems because the number of fingers on both hands is also 10. Ironically, contemporary software designers use a base 16 system every day. It's called hexadecimal. It leaves them a lot cleaner in information retrieval calculations, which are based on 16s and 32s and other binary byproducts. A base 16 math system would have worked out just fine in an older culture if you had a counting device. You could figure out your change at the corner market just as easily with 16 numbers as you could with 10. Frankly, um, my preference would be uh, five. I can go with seven. Anything beyond that is uh, superfluous uh, within the sort of reference to numerology and uh, mythic numerology in particular. Uh, I think I think it's um, but one can't criticize or um, condemn uh, others, most particularly in this case um, ancient civilizations, they had their own particular uh, demands and um, ideas and, and conventions and historical uh, uh, precedences and uh, precedencies. <laughs> when we interpret the glyphs which represent the numbers 10 through 15, We discover the source of an age-old dispute. Those upper numbers are depicted as sexual organs, rude body parts, and flatulism references. Here in, in Europe, I've never seen this, this sort of thing where, where the male uh, member is inserted uh, in, com in combinas combination. Com combinas com combination. With the, with the female, in the, it's all in 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 any in sense as you as you see here. Can can, can you see this? Yeah, it's 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 um, you see it's 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 the male and the female is all in in unified and and, and also in part. This is very very curious cu curious. 
One of the last major artifacts found on Kameno Island was a huge glass column, broken, of course, but restorable. On its surface, the team could see raised symbols similar to the math system previously found. But instead of 16 symbols, the obelisk displayed just 10, with evidence of considerable obliteration on the top section. You can see evidence that the flatulism reference, the, the erection, the penis, the vulva, the breast, and the anus have been expunged from their math system. I'd like to apologize about using those words in the, in the current day. This number system here has failed. I mean, you can see this is another attempt of a 14 number system. They went through a large period of uncertainty about which math system they wanted to use after that. Here are some of the uh, original rude numbers. We're missing a couple of them, and we're missing the number nine, too. They tried a number system without the kitty cat and the anus, and apparently that just didn't work for math. I'm not quite sure why. And the censoring of the number system implies that a society was willing to change their beliefs in science, math, and technology to satisfy their political and religious views. The education system in Kansas recently went through such a change in values. The only good, probably, that came out of this repression was the decimal system. We think this one here was an early adding machine. If you look at this as a base 16 device, you can add different numbers, getting down to the 10, which of course in this culture is 16. And in here you can actually add uh, one to a fart and you get, a, you get the number 10. Yeah. Uh, and apparently the, these different lines here are the additions that you're making to the uh, base unit at the top. It's very elegant, really. I think it's beautiful. Even, uh... Let's see what the original, the origination of the plus sign here, I think, is first displayed in this culture, too. Uh -huh. Now, by the same definition, we see this minus sign right here. So this is clearly a subtraction machine. Where and the minus sign? I guess there's right there. Oh, That's oh, sort of oh, that, oh. what appears to be oh. a dash here. Yeah. See, this would have only been uh, recognized as a minus sign because of the uh, Otherwise, knowledge. Otherwise, it's just a structural... Uh, no one would have really known. It could have been a buttress of some sort. Yeah. But again, here is our number system. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, etc. Going around to the kitty cat and beyond. This is really a Paleolithic computer. It provides a wonderful window into this remarkable culture. It proves the existence of negative numbers. Primitive people have always feared negative numbers. By doing simple arithmetic exercises with this prehistoric subtracting machine, it is easy to prove the existence visually of numbers like negative three, which are impossible to see, but with a device like this, easy to understand. Proving that a universe of negative numbers existed might not have been a politically correct decision for the maker of this pot. Particularly during the dark years when conservatism reigned, life in early Kameno Island times could have been filled with danger if you knew too much math. This one suggests a triangle. And it's a beautiful triangle that goes all the way down to the very bases here. It almost looks like a landscape. We've had some people analyze this, and they say this is a triangle similar to one invented by the Polish mathematician Sierpinski uh, in the early 20s. This is an early fractal, and they had some knowledge of fractal geometry, which really astounds the mathematicians. But again, we think that this information was probably tossed out with all of the rude body parts when the conservatives sort of came back in. So we think Mandelbrot's equation was just around the corner when they came in and took over, but what can I say?
This is a very significant part in uh, the dating process. We do have some clues here. Now this is a collection of stars across this top of this pot which tells some kind of a story and there's a whole bunch of stars here and they're all in a big mass and we've basically come to the conclusion that this represents a comet. What we found was that if you go down here to the bottom I'm going to spin this pot. Apparently when this comet comes by people believe that if they wore the proper footwear, they could go up to heaven after that comet. And you can see them sort of slowly working their way up here. And apparently these, these naked people believe that they could just go right up into heaven as soon as that comet went by. Well, we did some research into the Holly Bob comet and it turns out that it has a, a period of 5,500 years, which coincides quite well to our estimation, we think. So this is at least 5,000 years, maybe 11,000, maybe 16,500. We're not really sure which of the visits this inspired this pot to be made from. It at least gives us a ballpark. Yeah. Well, a lovely piece. Uh, it's very significant. This one's a beautiful example of sort of a recreational culture pot. After a while we determined these figures which look very similar to uh, Grand Canyon cliff dwelling paintings, but it turns out that they're clam diggers, oddly enough. You can find the familiar bucket and some kind of a strange hoe and down below here we see evidence of two sets of clams. There is one set that is near the surface which we think are similar to our butter clams today and then of course we have the gooey duck. At the five foot level, volunteers at the Rocky Point Garden site began to find terracotta figurines. A total of 47 figurines emerged as well as a rusted metal slab weighing over 300 pounds. Small effigies seem to be common to all primitive cultures. The famous Venus of Willendorf was found in present-day Romania. It was one of a group of figurines similar to the Kameno Cluster. Women seem to be the main subject with these first figural artifacts, which are found in sites all over the world dating back to 50,000 years ago. To simple cultures, the birth of a child was treated as a miracle, which of course it is. Nearly every Paleolithic image on Earth, regardless of the culture, reflects this. The Kameno Venuses were no exception. It's clear that women were worshipped and wandered about on these shores as well. Uh, and these other people mostly were observers that would crowd around and look, but one of the people putting this together sort of arranged them in this fashion, which looks probably like a baseball game. Baseball goes a lot further back than Abner Doubleday. All the early cultures in North and South America enjoyed some kind of spectator sports. In 1990, a lone man-made mound in the region of Chiapas, Mexico, was investigated by researchers from a Canadian university. Instead of housing or temples, they discovered clay benches and a playing alley as long as a modern football field. Twice the size of previously known Mayan ball courts, built thousands of years later. We estimate this early stadium to be over 5,400 years old. From what we can determine, the object was to put a leather ball like this through a stone circle high upon a wall without using your hands. Theory suggests that the scoring player was rewarded with all the jewelry and clothing that the spectators were wearing. Friends of the winning player, in Mexico at least, were expected to chase down the fans after the game for their share of the booty. The fact that they're actually still watching this event and they're already naked suggests that this might be the second game of a doubleheader. We also find that a great number of these figures are done in a very white clay and an another equally large number are done in a terracotta. We find that the extra white clay people sit a little taller and they have their legs crossed too and they're a little bit more proper than the terracotta people who are, for the most part, pregnant.
Every culture's got its erotica, you know, there's no question about it. These were sort of the Playboy magazines or the erotic websites of the early cultures. Uh, das ist, uh, nein, 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 wir, wir haben mehr hier, more, more, uh, very interesting, this, this part here, this is uh, interior, yeah, it's going inside, we think, um, now what, what kind of mind does these people have mit this concentration, mit uh, this, uh, the female, uh, obviously, uh, um, elemental, Aperitur, was denken diese people? But they were probably really popular with the terracotta people. Frankly, it's upsetting. This is so beautiful that we weren't really sure that this belonged to this culture. We thought this might have been an artifact from some other part of the world. I don't want to really put this into our culture. As a matter of fact, I've sold this pot uh -huh. because it was much too beautiful to fit with my world. But we borrowed it back for the nature of the show. How much did you get for it? Four hundred dollars. You probably not rather say that. Uh, no, I did quite well with it actually. Uh, but I don't deal in ancient artifacts very often because there's an ethical issue there. A culture grows, prospers, it declines. And the Dark Age leads into the future as the past is scraped and flattened by the spreading ice cap. But where did the people go? The Kamano Island excavation had one more treasure to reveal that would answer this question and pose a number of new questions for today. The piece of glass almost escaped detection. A pile of neighborhood trash disguised a portion of the slab uncovered by a heavy winter storm. It was the tip of an iceberg which led to another cache of sporting figures and Venuses and a much more elaborate stadium. And with it a link to the present. It was a find which astonished even the artifact-hardened Kamano Island excavation team. In the end, two bronze models of sports arenas were uncovered, along with two slabs of primitive cast glass and numerous figurines in bronze, clay, and amazingly glass. Most incredible of all was a framework of metal enclosing a series of huge hinges, which, when placed on top of the architectural model, appeared to suggest a roof. More than that, a retractable roof that was planned for a structure 35,000 years ago. The ancient past is littered with examples of sports stadiums. A few even sported some protection from the weather. And here, it would have been about 25 meters thick. And the whole thing, to keep that semicircle going, would have been big enough to hold St. Paul's Cathedral inside. But none of them works like this. Huge columns provided a viewing platform and shelter for the early Mount Vernon elite. They would travel across the lozenge-shaped field, pulling the hinged roof across the length of the stadium. This, these corporate boxes would move across the field this way in a parallel fashion and cause this roof to expand. And it worked quite well, it's a little rusty. The of hockey type activity. Kamano Island site was an important link to many unsolved historical puzzles in more recent Northwest history. They all involve a legend. Lewis and Clark were the first Europeans to encounter this story in 1806 on their discovery adventure across the Pacific Northwest. And now I will read from their journal. November 12, 1803. Today, on the fifth day, 
at the Stevens Pass Camp Sacagawea return. She has news of a band of women who had been sighted recently by the Skykomish people. She tells me that contact with this group is exceedingly infrequent. Women are known to favor a sport which, when described, appears to be similar to lacrosse. November 15th, 1803. We've exited the mountains and headed toward a thickly forested shoreline, heavy hearted at not having met the female sporting tribe. Our loins, heavy from the absence of the fair sex on our journey, had quickened as of late at the thought of such a meeting. The campfire conversations lately have turned again to sheep, which, and here's the famous missing page that Lewis and Clark never wanted anyone to really see. That reference to the women in the mountains remained the only one recorded in the 19th century. In the 20th century, as populations grew, more encounters with this band were inevitable. To the popular Cascade mountain photographer, Asho Curtis, at the turn of the century, this mythical group became an obsession. In his later years, he confided to his friends, his brilliant career as a photographer in the North Cascades was spent in a futile attempt to find and photograph this elusive band in their domain. Curtis was crushed when he heard that a relative stranger to the Northwest, L.G. Linkletter, had succeeded in photographing some of this mythical band of women on Paradise Glacier, high on the side of Mount Rainier. Is there a connection between the female hockey-playing figurines, carved at the end of the last ice age and discovered on Kamano Island, and these mythical mystery women? Although reported sightings are numerous in the 20th century, hard evidence is rare. In 1931, the Bishop of Seattle snapped this view during a rather adventurous religious retreat with the other West Coast bishops on the side of Mount Rainier near a present-day meadow they call Camp Muir. This hazy image stood as the only recent documentation of the hockey women myth. A mining engineer caught this footage in 1983 from a small plane flying toward a conference in Lake Chelan, but nothing came of it. I did some paintings of the moon playing hockey there that I'd like you to see. I flew some women up to a glacier in 1999 and I had them try to recreate this culture. This one is a kick save. This woman is the goalie, there's no question about that. You like more information? And this person is coming in which we think is an early breakaway. The band of women remained a 20th century rumor, the Pacific Northwest Coast version of an urban legend until the capture of a wanted Norwegian fugitive added new light on a thousand-year-old myth. The mountains of the Pacific Northwest have long been a haven for odd characters. Unreasonable people. And those who had no use for neighbors. The little town of Darrington, nestled in a steep-walled cul-de-sac in the North Cascades, was such a place. It came into regional prominence last summer with the capture of its most elusive residence, a fugitive hermit we'll call Stan. In 15 years, living on the run from cabin to cache, high in the North Cascades, Stan reported many encounters with the mystery woman myth. Only once did he meet them face to face. Now in the state penitentiary, Stan was eager to tell his story. It was very difficult in the mountains up there. 
Crime is not a word you think about in a high altitude. The mountains, they're beautiful, but they have no soul. Until that night when I saw the women. Many times, in the highest and most difficult terrain, I'd seen their marks in the snow. I knew their scat, but I never knew their source until one moonlit evening near the mountain they call Glacier Peak. I had walked to a crest and was resting when I saw them. They were marching single file along a mountain ridge. I counted seven of them. The moon was full. I hid behind the crest and I watched them as if it were the hour of noon. They played with a fierceness that I have never seen, even in the Stalin years, even in the Viking times. They played like Russians, yet they looked like angels. I was spellbound. It was... It... It was like they moved in a silent ballet. I watched an unseen artist's hand create an alphabet of symbols with their bodies. They used their limbs and trunks together and sent a message to the sky. When I woke up, they were gone. The events of the rest of the evening are difficult to recall. I remember something about being discovered. Then something wonderful. The next day, I felt odd, but well all day although a little sleepy, and I felt the curious urge to smoke a cigarette. Have we seen these symbols before in the ancient recounting of the Mount Vernon culture? Many places in the New World are known for strange symbols not yet explained. They're barely one leg up on a trophy right now. That is, if I'm any judge of form. Some display messages aimed only at the sky. This one is of first or second century uh, Chinese bronze piece that I have on loan from the Chinese Museum, which appears to be espousing a decimal system. Since the, the, the birth of the decimal system is documented in our culture, uh, this is just more evidence that the Chinese, once again, have been getting information from us over that land bridge, which of course it's a direct road right to China from uh, Siberia. And we sort of think that their decimal system use was, was based on uh, early Mount Vernon conservative censorship. This is a 5th century Hylix uh, from ancient Greece, which seems to suggest that this fellow was doing a kick save of some kind. This is not the, one. the early Greeks were uh, quite fascinated by these by this news from over the Silk Road. These people would bring it in in the opposite direction mm -hmm. with the news of the hockey game. Down here we see in the Indian subcontinent there's an early philosopher's stone that suggests that a number of hockey players uh, had a negative influence perhaps on the Shiva. Can you talk to me about that, Barbie? Well, I, I just, it's clear that it's, it's a representation of a very early hockey playing Barbie, and it's, uh, it's amazing that, I mean, 
her clothes are still on the doll's body. It's just amazing. We don't think that was a very popular uh, version of Barbie, and we never found the Ken either that goes along with that. And is he involved in sports activities as well? No, he was. I, I, we've just found out that men weren't allowed to watch the women play hockey, so we don't think that Ken was really in this picture. Although I did hear recently of an early divorce Barbie, and uh, she has all of Ken's things. <laughs> <laughs> but that's Did the Mount Vernon culture simply disappear? Or did the knowledge of these remarkable and creative people simply get scattered? and simplified, and carried to distant corners of the planet, where they found a reception, free from fear, and far from small-brained leaders who would dare to smother the human need for expression and censor the numbers of love. Danke schön, gnädige Fräulein, für diese. Aber dieser Schrad, das scheiße Schrad, ist, 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 ist that's what I think of your evidence for this. This is false, truly false. I cannot say more. Yeah, Wolf, bitte schön. Can we hear it again? Huh? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. of love. Thank you very much, dear Fräulein, for that. But this shard, this scheisse shard, is... 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 That's what I think of your evidence for this. This is false, truly false. I cannot say more. Yeah, Wolf, bitte schön. Can we hear it again? Huh? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. 